I'm excited to speak about this uh, convergence of biotechnology with information technology. Now, I just wanted to quickly define my terms. Biotechnology is technology that uses living systems as its medium. Information technology is what? Is information basically uh, a system, a technology that uses information as its technology um, or as its medium? And I, I would say that the two have fused together over the last couple of decades. Um, and I, I would also say that traditional biotech is now changing in a significant way. I think the days of pipetting, I don't, I guess this is new to you, but by pipetting and petri dishes, um, lab notebooks, all of those are waning. And what's emerging is starting to look like computing. And I think that's really exciting. I think it's kind of scary, um, but I also think it's really powerful, and that's why we're discussing this. So I will start at the beginning. So I don't know if you know who this is. This is Erwin Schrodinger. He's famous for Schrodinger's cat. The cat is, that is both alive and dead at the same time. It's in a box. The physicists know. Anyway, he, he won a Nobel Prize in quantum physics quite a while ago, but he's also quite well known in biology because in 1943 he gave a talk in Dublin to a big crowd, much bigger than this, 400 people, um, with the title, What is Life? And he tried to explain life in terms of physics. And the talk was actually so popular, he had to give it multiple times. He, so here's our, here's our living system. This is, a, this is an E. coli. He, pro he proposed that the foundation of living things, the, the genetic information, was stored in what he called an aperiodic crystal. In each cell, there was this crystal that somehow contained all the information that made life do what it does. Now, I, I just want to quickly explain what that means, because I think the aperiodicity uh, is actually really important. So I'm going to give you an example. So um, right there, you have a salt crystal, which is very periodic. You have these cubes, and the molecules are lined up in just the same way over and over. Um, you can't really store information in the system like that, because you only have one pattern that repeats and repeats and repeats. On the other hand, you have a book, and in the book you have these letters, and the letters can be mixed in, ma mixed in different ways, and you get meaning out of that. Now, he's arguing that you can do the same thing with life. Basically, let's move on. Oh. So, the term aperiodic crystal, there we are. Launched scientists, uh, launched biologists on a hunt for, for that crystal. And when they found it, it fundamentally changed biology. Um, a decade after his lecture, here's Francis Crick and uh, Jim Watson. They uncovered the double helix structure of DNA. Um, now, I just want to explain how it works. So the long sides of the DNA are kind of like a shell. That's like the pr protective outside. And the business ends, um, some of you already know this, the A's, T's, C's, and G's. That's, that's where the information gets stored. Now, the A's and T's bond with each other, and then C's and G's bond with each other. Um, so these are the rungs. And, and I think, actually, this moment when, when Watson and Crick presented to, this, to the world, um, this was the big moment of convergence between biology, on one hand, and information, on the other hand. And, and the reason is because it's not the number of nucleotides, these are nucleotides, that matter and it's not the amount of them that matter. So in a strawberry, the ones that you have on your plate actually have more DNA in, them, in each cell than we do, um, which I think is kind of fascinating. So it's not the amount of, of nucleotides that matter, but it's actually the sequence of them. And that, that sequence, the, the difference between, you know, the difference in order separates us from I'm going to make it up, a tree, but also separates a tree from a lobster, which separates all organisms. It's a sequence that matters, not the amount of the sequence. So I'm going to give you a quick high school biology lesson in how DNA works like information. Um, he, this is what basically uh, Watson and Crick outlined in their, in their, in their finding. It's called the um, central dogma of molecular biology. And here's how it works. It's three steps. Okay, so the DNA... To make a protein, which is kind of the workhorse of every cell, 
The DNA sits inside the nucleus. It unzips another molecule called an RNA, comes in there, and it starts to copy those nucleotides on the side. So it basically creates, um, well, let me start all over. There's a polymerase that sits on top of the DNA, and it copies out this RNA. The RNA leaves the nucleus, something called a ribosome forms around it, and basically three letters at a time, it pops out these amino acids, which as they come out, fold into a protein. So if you change the sequence of those nucleotides, you get a different protein, and you get a different function. So you mix and match these in different ways, and you get different functions within the cell. So basically what's happening is information from this part is getting transferred to this part, and you get different outcomes. All right, that's my science lesson. I'll move on from there. So ever since that finding, well, ever since Watson and Crick, uh, biologists have been collecting and parsing this DNA information. Why? Because the DNA information is sort of the key to getting these proteins. And if you have a, lo a lot of it, you can mix them in different ways and you can get lots of different functionality that you wouldn't just get from a, an organism on its own. Um, so this is a nice chart that shows how many um, genomes scientists have collected over the years. So you'll see in 2007, we had very few. 2016, there's been just a, a huge number. I have it here. There are 50,000 bacterial genomes that have been sequenced, 14,000 eukaryotes, including the human genomes that have been sequenced. Um, and all of that is chock full of information for your biotechnologist. Uh, I'm I don't want to touch on human DNA. I think that's, that's a subject that's been covered here. Um, what I want to talk about is engineering with biology, basically engineering with that DNA, um, genetic engineering, synthetic biology. Um, so here's the first application of genetic engineering in the market. Uh, Herb Boyer and Stanley Cohen engineered E. coli to produce human insulin in 1982. Uh, until that point, human insulin had to come from pancreases of pigs and cows. Um, and it wasn't actually human insulin, it was animal insulin. And so there were significant differences. Um, the interesting thing here is that you could take a bacteria, which obviously is very distant from a human being, plug in various nucleotides, right, various amounts of information, and you could put out a human protein. It's very powerful. Um, and it, I would say there's a huge potential for creativity in, in doing this kind of mixing and matching. Um, so here's the question that, I, that I'm going to pose to you over and over throughout this talk, and that's that if you had all the things uh, life produces out in the world, all the chemicals, the materials, the compounds, all the structures available to you, what would you make with it? And this is kind of the, the question that bioengineers are asking. So here's one vision. This quote comes from a, a guy named Tom Knight. Tom Knight is actually famous as being one of the original MIT hackers who basically you know, w was at the foundation of computing. So I didn't put the slide in, but there's a picture of him as a, maybe a 20-year-old uh, building the first Lisp machine. Um, and that machine's actually now at the MIT Museum as like an, an artifact from history. Anyway, Tom Knight, one of the original MIT computer hackers, was also one of the founders of this movement called synthetic biology, which I'll get to in a little bit. And here's his vision. I'm just going to read a little quote from him. We don't know how to run an economic system based on abundance rather than scarcity, but we would best learn rapidly. Rapidly, I, I, I would say the synthetic biologists here are extremely, extremely optimistic some of that optimism has faded over the years, but Tom Knight is still around. So 20, 20 years ago, Knight and a group of computer scientists at Berkeley and MIT and other places, they looked at DNA and they tried to treat it like computer code. And I, I would say this is the sort of the logical extension that started with Schrodinger, even before Schrodinger, but I'll, I'll skip the other guys, uh, predicted, so started with Schrodinger, went to Watson and Crick, um, and then finally to about 20 years ago. Um, and the idea here is that if, if really the chemical structure of DNA is used for storing information, then you can start coding with it just like you might start coding with a computer. So 
just I want to explain a little bit about this group. They weren't biologists like your traditional biologists. They, they were visibly different. So if you went to Tom Knight's lab at, in 1999, 2000, you would see a computer on the lab bench, which at that point was just unheard of. Why would you have a computer at the lab bench? The other funny thing about his lab was that it wasn't in the bio, bio department. It was actually in the computer science department. Um, and so all the uh, computer scientists actually avoided him. They didn't know what was going on, some secret DARPA project. Um, so, but to synthetic biologists like Knight, the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's looked a lot like zeros and ones, right? A lot like machine language. And they thought, well, if we could treat it like machine language, then we could actually do a lot more than what bioengineers have done until this point. In 2000, they actually proved that you can actually, yes, treat a living system, a living organism, something like an electronic thing. Um, so they built in a toggle switch, right? So literally an on-off switch in, in, in bacteria. So when it was on, they add one chemical, the bacteria would glow green. When it was off, they add another chemical, and boom, the bacteria just stayed in its non-colored form. Um, and if you look at the way that they, they actually modeled it, you'll see, uh, I don't, some of you are a little far away, but it looks a lot like uh, a circuit. I'm going to give you another example. So a lot of people saw that and got very excited, and they tried to put in electronic circuits as well. So here's, a, uh, here's an oscillator. This is uh, Jeff Hasey's lab at UCSD. So you see the bacteria growing, but at the same time, they're oscillating in color on, off, on, off, on, off. They did crazy things like make, um, this is a mammalian cell. This is actually a kidney cell that uh, acts like a, like a little calculator. And so you'll see this little uh, logic table, right? When no chemicals are added, you've got, you get no color. When one chemical is added on either side, you get this yellow-green color. And if you get both of them, so chemical one plus chemical two, you get a third color, that's two. So zero, one, two. Uh, very interesting, very strange. I don't think bioengineers even thought to do things like that until that moment. I'm gonna give you one more. I don't know if you can see that, it says hello world. They actually got bacteria to um, basically act like, like a bacterial film, like a film, like a, like a film film, like a camera film, um, using this technique. So these are all toy systems, but I think they demonstrated, at least to the, to the bio biology world, that yes, you could treat biology or living thing like a machine, and it can behave like a machine. Um, so with varying success, the synthetic biologists took it upon themselves to use concepts from computing to make bioengineering easier to do. So they hid all the A's and T's and C's and G's, right? That, that was to them the zeros and ones. They hid it under a layer of abstraction, and you get things like this. So this is a promoter. Basically, let's go back to Watson and Crick just for a moment. Or, or um, when that polymerase sits down on the DNA, it's being told to sit down by this thing, the promoter. And that's literally just a string of, of, of letters. So that, all those letters get hidden in the abstraction. And then we can go on. Here's the gene, right? So it's telling it, I want you to glow green. And then this is the end. This is the terminator. So this is actually the toggle switch. Um, and you basically have, it's hard to explain. You basically have the strand of DNA. You have a thing called a repressor, which turns one side off, and a repressor over here turning the other side off. And they interact with each other. So if you put something that one repressor go away, the other one, the other gene goes on, and, and vice versa. So you get this kind of back and forth. Anyway, so one, they attempted abstraction. Um, they created this visual system to take out some of the complexity um, in engineering. Um, and then they created sort of like a, a radio shack for, for biological parts. Right, so no longer would you go to the organism and collect the DNA from that organism and then port it to another organism. You would go to the central place um, and you would say, well, I want that one, that one, and that one. And you also would know that these genes can actually fit together, can work together. So 
That's the other thing that they tried to do. The other thing that they noticed is that, well, the price of synthesizing and sequencing DNA, so the reading and writing of DNA, is falling precipitously. Um, at least the, the, uh, the, uh, the sequencing part is falling faster than Moore's law, um, meaning that uh, it's, the prices are falling faster than they would ha than um, computer chips. So that's interesting. For them, that meant that very quickly, they'll no longer need the original organism at all. They'll literally just print out DNA, string it together, put it into the new organism, and just work from that. On top of that, um, over the last 15 years, I've, I've seen synthetic biology's ideas about programming, programming biotech kind of go mainstream. And so not only are we seeing them treating uh, DNA like an information system, but all of lab work is now becoming automated too. So, so what does that mean? That means that a scientist can sit at his desk, just like this, and then plug in an experiment onto the internet, and then this machine lab, basically, which has a robot arm and lots of the equipment available that, that you need to do um, genetic engineering, it all happens in that lab. The, the scientist is no, no longer has to be in the space with his materials. Now, that's a significant change. So I'll give you two companies, just so you know, that are doing that. That's Emerald, BioCloud, and Transcriptic. And all of them, both of them have cloud services. Um, here's another thing. So usually, you have an army of graduate students who are doing your lab work, and the labs, and the, and the graduate students are basically following a protocol, doing the pipetting and putting things into the freezer and all that other stuff. Um, no longer necessary. So here's something called Antha. It's a, it's basically a programming language where you tell your robots what you want them to do what protocol to follow, and then the robots will do them. So if, you, if you're really close like I am, you can see that there's a sample volume of so like what's in the tube, how much is in the tube, and it just goes on from there. Now the interesting thing about this is that it, rather than actually doing, you know, you following the protocol, you would just literally cut and paste a protocol to another protocol, and all those protocols strung together would do the gen genetic engineering for you. I think this is where things are going. What does that mean? So you've got synthetic biologists who are treating DNA like machines, or yes, like machines, yet, but more like information systems. You've got automated labs. Um, I think there's, I think that's fantastic. I think that gives them a lot more power. I also think there's a danger inherent here. Um, and that's that if I'm a biologist or this is a future biotechnologist sitting at my desk. I have this illusion of control that if I just plug this, this, and this here, I will get X result. And I think, one, that is a recipe for a lot of failed experiments. Uh, I think, two, you have the, op the, the, the possibility of doing something really stupid uh, just because you haven't thought it through. Um, I think the truth is that heavily, these, these heavily automated, software-heavy DNA syst uh, systems where the DNA is hidden under abstraction um, still requires its own paradigm. I don't think we can really call it an information technology, per se. I think it's its own thing, because biotech is, is not computing. Um, I'll give you an idea. So when humans started programming computers, and, and you guys know better than me, they started from scratch, and all the computer, all the components, and the way they were put together were used with were, were created with human logic. We thought about how things should fit together. We put them together in ways we thought belonged together. Now this is this is the metabolic processes of a bacterial cell. Um, it does not look like human logic. Basically. All of these dots, I, I, again, I'm sorry for the people back there who can't see it, those are chemicals that a bacteria will make. So, you know, this chemical here with an, an extra process on top of it will bring you to this chemical here and so on and so forth. So you get all these kind of nodes that are strung together. Because 
living systems don't work in a logical way, you could make a change to some sort of molecule over here. Maybe it'll produce less or more or whatever. And it could have ramifications in any one of the dots around here. Or conversely, you might want to do something, have your molecule produce something like a biofuel. Well, other parts of that system will say, hey, wait, we don't want to be doing that. And, and basically, it'll, it'll repress whatever it is you're trying to do. So my point here is that living things don't operate with human logic. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that, you know, so much is happening so quickly with biotech. Um, it's sort of hard to keep up. Um, over the decade, you'll see that venture money has poured in, and, and a string of new biotech tools have opened up into the world. And I think... You know, we have on one part, we have these information systems that are built into biotech. On the other hand, we have all these new opportunities to do interesting things with it. I think those opportunities, that mix of the two, those new tools, um, get us to a place where there are a lot of possibilities, but there's also a lot of controversies. I'm just going to list out a couple. Um, so one, there's something called a gene drive. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but this is a new system or a system that's been under development for a long time where you can put the system into, for example, a mosquito, put that mosquito out into the wild, and it will mate, and over generations, you will have an entire species that change. There will be a different species. So you can do things like you can crash a population of, a, of an organism. You can fundamentally change that organism so it's immune to some sort of thing like a like, for example, maybe Zika virus or, or malaria. Um, that's one. That's incredibly powerful. Another one, you know, there's this huge debate now going on over ger human germline gene editing, meaning going into an embryo or a sperm or an egg and making a change in that. And I think that's very interesting uh, and concerning because it literally means that a change you make now will affect that person and generations later. Third one. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, last year, uh, a scientist pr basically engineered yeast to produce opiates. Now, that's interesting. So, I, in a way, that's a wonderful thing, right? Opiates come from war-torn places and are, and, and are a problem politically. Maybe it's better to get them from a, a lab here in the States. But at the same time, how hard would it be to get like a, a basically a, a microbe out of that lab, and then you have a problem of people being able to produce this wherever they wanted. So that, that's an interesting one. Um, in July, the White House called for a review of the way that um, government regulates biotech. And this review is the first that's happened since 1992, since basically uh, the introduction of GM crops. And I think the reason why this is happening is because there's so much momentum happening now within biotech. Um, so what do we do? Um, I think too often the public reaction to a new technology, especially when it has to do with biology, is, is binary. Um, you get a response that's either, this is really good or this is really bad. I think we've seen that with GMOs, and, and, and the, com the conversation never goes anywhere. Right? There's never a conclusion. It just goes circle and circle and circle. What I'm advocating for here is kind of a, is a deeper conversation um, where you have a broad number of stakeholders who are discussing not whether a technology is good or bad, not whether this new confluence of biotech and information tech coming together to make this new thing is good or bad. I think the conversation really shouldn't be about that. I think the conversation should be about, well, here we have this tool. What do we want to do with it? How are we going to use it? Um, that's where the conversation should be happening. That's where the community should come together and talk about it. I think the problem often is, is that communities don't actually have a shared language when they talk about a thing. They don't understand when that th how that thing actually works out in the world. So with biotech, I want to establish... Um, I want to establish actually some, some rules. Like, how does it work? Why, how is it different from let's say, information technology, or how is it different from really any other engineering practice out there? So I'm just going to go through a list. 
Here's one. So one, life is material, right? Unlike information tech where you can hit a delete button, when you produce something out in the world, a living thing, it exists out there. And to get it out of the, that world is uh, intensive labor. So I'll give you an example. Uh, cane toads in Australia. Like this is, you release this into an environment and it has spread into that environment and it's incredibly hard to get it out of that environment. At the same time, it's fantastic that life is material. If you look around this room, a lot of the materials were once living things at some point, at some stage. So you have this huge power, you also have this huge, um, I don't want to say, maybe a threat. Number two, life is unpredictable. Now, this is a beautiful organism. Um, it's, it's called uh, P. vortex, and it makes these beautiful fractal patterns. You could put a dish of this next to a dish of it in the same exact conditions or similar conditions, and you'll get completely different patterns. Um, so on one hand, that's wonderful, right? You get the variety of life, great. On the other hand, it makes it really hard to control and hard to work with. I'll give you another one, life is plastic. I actually, I really like this slide because it just, it really illustrates it well. Um, you could take one tree species, put that in the root system, this is grafting, uh, take another species, put it on top of them, on top of it, and the two will fuse together into one, two, kind of one and a half organisms. Um, that's hugely important and, and fantastic, right? All of our apple orchards work similar to that. You know, the, uh, the little cuties that, you know, the tangerines, same thing. Um, but it's also kind of strange, different from anything I've known. Number four, life self-replicates. Again, hugely, this is mitosis, by the way. Um, so these are cells actually separating. Um, so life self-replicates, that's also, again, fantastic. It means that if you have one organism that produces your fuel or your chemical or whatever compound you're interested in, it means that you actually have millions. So you could take um, something like an E. coli, put it into an incubator, 20 minutes later you'll have two E. coli, you let it sit there overnight, you'll have millions of E. coli. That's fantastic. You can imagine an organism that would be producing your compounds just dividing. Literally, you have an endless number of factories. On the other hand, you get that in the environment, and it, if it likes its environment, you, you have yourself a problem. Number five, life is massively independent. So I, I love this slide. This is, this is a, um, basically a food web in a, in, in a forest ecosystem. But the idea here is that that's, that's wonderful. It means you have a sustainable system, right? All your waste streams get eaten up by your system. So you've got this nice, beautiful loop. The problem there is that if you mess with that system, if you remove some of the, the, the key species, you could seriously cause echoing effects, cascading effects throughout the system, cause a real mass. Number six, this is the last one, life mutates, and I, I think Trisha really got at this. Um, so again, the mutation, the fact that life mutates or it evolves is fantastic for us. It gives us all of those fantastic proteins that scientists are going and, and grabbing for. At the same time, again, it makes it very hard to work with. So I'll give you an example very quickly. Um, so for the biofuels industry or, or the comp the compound industry that basically plug in these DNA instructions to have things like yeast or E. coli produce compounds for us. Um, you put them in what's called a bubble chamber and they start producing fuel. But what will happen is that they will evolve away from that. It's highly energy intensive to make that compound. So within a short period of time, actually two weeks, they'll evolve away from what you've programmed into them and you have to start that process again all over. So these are all sort of hurdles, but these are also features. So these are good, bad, depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so given that life has all these features and biotechnology has all these features, what, what I'm kind of asking is what, how do we use it given those features? What are, what are some applications we should encourage using this as our system? Um, 
What should we maybe proceed with cautiously, but do anyway? And then finally, what should we just say, hey, we don't want to do this at all. Let's forbid this. Um, so, so here's, again, what I'd like to see in the next few, few years. I'd like to see stakeholders from a wide diversity of backgrounds come together and develop what would look like a general set of principles for how do we use this stuff? Because it doesn't look like anything else we, we use out in the world. Um, over the last year and a half, I've kind of moved away from journalism to kind of address this qu a question. And the group that I've been doing it with uh, are students. So we have a program at GenSpace called the, the Bio Design Challenge. And we've actually gone to art and design students and asked them the same question. Right? If you have these set of features in a living system, and you were tasked with making something, what would you make and why? Um, what are some of the concerns you would have if, if you make these things? Um, and it's been really interesting. So I'm going to just kind of flip through some slides. We, we had our first semester um, just finish in, in December, and we've had some really interesting, bizarre ideas. Now, this is kind of a take on the microbiome rather than having you know, uh, microorganisms living on our body, which we already naturally do. Uh, this team thought about, well, what if we actually had living, like, you know, larger species on us, and how would we work as a kind of ecosystem together? Um, I'll give you another one. Here's the, what they call the bio toothbrush, which I, th I think was quite lovely, um, which is basically, well, you know, our, the orifice that we basically put a sensor in every day is the toothbrush. What can we sense with it? What can we change using that? And they came up with all these fantastic ideas like taking a readout of your health or, or you know, producing um, basically, uh, how, do I, how would I say, like vitamins for you. So while you brush your teeth, you're actually getting nutrition. It was a lot of fun. Um, I think this is sort of the beginning of a discussion with these students. And students are thinking not from the scientific perspective. They're thinking from how do I use this thing? Sort of like uh, the user's perspective, the, the human perspective. I think scientists are generally really good at thinking from the molecular perspective. These students are thinking basically about how to interact with this technology out in the world. And I think just having lots and lots of these visions out there, some might not make sense, some might be silly, some might be really good. I think it's ultimately, it doesn't matter. I think what matters is that we have a lot so that as a public, we can look at these visions and imagine out or, or see how this might be able to play out and then make decisions based on those. So I'm just going to finish up and say, you know, we are engaging the art and design community in, in this way. And, and by engaging with them, we actually have the scientific community in, involved as well. So that's fantastic. I think the data community is the next piece of the puzzle. Um, and I, I believe that simply because a lot of what's going on in the technology, in the biotechnology, is coming from the info, information technology. And so having this community in the conversation would just be unbelievably wonderful and, and helpful. So uh, with that, um, I'm looking forward to our conversations. Mm -hmm. And let's move on to part two of the afternoon. Thank you. While you guys are Instagramming your DNA strands, let's start off a discussion to, so we can segue into the third part of our talk today. Um, I, I know I have a question. Is that one of the things that we, I think about when it comes to, I think there is a, I wonder if there is a parallel when with modern algorithms, a lot of times there are results that even the people working on them, they can't explain because they're so complex like neural nets. And they, it's, it's because the inputs and no one ever takes time to think about the inputs because they're just so busy building the algorithm. So does that, can that happen here where the results of what are confounding? is yeah, or just like confusing. Always. Always confounding. I think more often than not, you get results that don't make sense to you or don't work. It's it's the rare occasion that you get a, a product that actually does contain the genes that you put into it, and and so on and so forth. You sort of have to create the conditions for the back. Let's say you're using bacteria. Um, you have to create the conditions where they will take up your DNA. Um, so yeah, I think very often, yeah, the results are confounding. I think what's interesting about some of those rules that I 
kind of listed out, are you, you could see parallels in other spheres, right, in other technologies. But I don't know if there are other technologies that have all of them. Um, and I'm, I'm actually really curious because, Caroline, you work in AI ethics. And I'm curious what, come, like, what you think from your perspective with all this headway that you guys have been making in this area. I mean, it's something really fascinating to sort of look at uh, systems thinking across all different kinds of systems. But I think one thing that sort of is fascinating about artificial intelligence is, like, we're in this uncanny valley when it comes to language, except we're nowhere close to the uncanniness. Like, it's, it's very years. We're years away. And it's fascinating to see, um, I guess, on my end, because I deal a lot with harassment, uh, and I've been thinking about that with artificial intelligence, um, the frustration that rises up trying to automate specific tasks and where in which like humans can fit in to alleviate that frustration um, or are we like redesigning or trying to automate systems that we're actually causing like uh, more harm to automate than than could than than creating like a solvable solution and I feel like a lot of that is just because we're in this weird place of where can you fit in um, like humans better into that system. So does it mean instead of having a purely automated system, are there points of like human help or human intervention, like working alongside something and then moving back and forth? Um, so it's sort of one thing I found really fascinating about this talk was to think about ways in which you can use um, like bacteria almost as a circuit or like where in which computer science can come into like bioengineering and biohacking. And then sort of what are the ramifications of that, right? Like as you were saying uh, later on, like being able to replicate like opiates inside of a lab, um, wh at what point will like is discovery beyond discovery? Do we have to start getting into the ethical ramifications of what we're making? Like, great, we did this thing, but now what does that actually? What are the bigger impacts of this discovery upon like greater systems at large? There wasn't much of a question in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I totally, I totally agree with you. I think where I where I sit is I'm much more interested. I think for the. The first six years of my career, I was very excited about how it all worked together, how you actually managed to do these scientific wonders. And I think over the last two years, I started to think about the applications. So what are you, what are you gonna use it for? And, and should we use it for these things? So opiates, I mean, are, is a perfect example where you could just see all kinds of ways that that might not be a great idea, but on the other hand, it might be a fantastic idea. Um, and I think it's now, uh, that's about how we as a society, we as a nation, decide to work with or not work with that technology. And that's sort of why I'm even standing here or sitting here. I guess I, I've been thinking about this a lot, like, as a follow-up to that. Like, is there a role, like, is this more of, like, a legality role, or is this something where, like, we need code of conduct and, like, ethicists involved in any in any sort of systems when it comes to, like, changing, be it like new kinds of biology or discoveries within that, or like systems that interact with humans. Um, like when you think about like the ramifications of someone interacting with artificial intelligence in an everyday way, like should there be, like what are, what, what, what is like, what, what is like an artificial intelligence bill of rights or like ethical guidelines look like just in terms of design or even algorithmic, like when you start structuring the algorithms. Or what is like a piece of DNA's bill of rights <laughs> too. Right. <laughs> That's a good question. I I don't. Get that out there. <laughs> I mean, I I think. I think if you were going to have a group of people around the table trying to figure out, a set of principles, for how to work with, let's say or 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 artificial intelligence, you need the broadest number of stakeholders available to you because if you really believe that the technology is going to change, our lives in fundamental ways, then. Every, everyone should be sitting at that table, or everyone should be represented at that table. Um, what well, do you what, think? What kind of, who else has worked in this room on, who is working on ethic, you know, big data ethics? I know there's a project going on here. And what headway have you guys made in your work in getting more stakeholders at the table? Maybe Dana, you can comment on this too after afterwards. Um, so Ashley and I are designing a 
blockchain system for farmers right now. This is one of, it's a community operating system. Um, so involving all the people that will be a part of that process in the decision making beforehand and creating like a democratic blockchain process with smart contracts is what they call them. So like human checkpoints um, based on what's happening. But I guess for us, it's understanding like that the design doesn't happen by everybody, but the input comes from everybody for the design. So that's what, what does it mean when you say input and what you're designing? Who are you designing for again? What is it? I didn't um, we're designing for a community in Sullivan County in upstate New York. Um, and it's like a farming based community. Okay. So what are the, what kind of what do the inputs look like when you have humans helping you with that? Yeah, so a lot of community meetings uh, organized by us and by others, um, really like building roots in the community to like enable the human process to happen, like re relying a lot on relationships, um, and I guess like it's not always so easily replicable, like easy to replicate, but um, just understanding that there is that human process to it. Um, and I guess the, the meetings themselves, um, like getting input from everybody, recording the input, like, like giving feedback, receiving feedback, going back and forth. So then the design kind of takes like that human process of the meeting and then puts it into the simplest interface that replicates what occurs in that meeting. Can you give us an example of what a human input would look like um, or that, that you've actually taken and then designed in? Yeah, so like an input is like um, I have a tractor or I have like, <laughs> um, I have um, space, um, I have time. Yeah, I have elder, so like for an example, we have a, uh, farmer who has um, leftover fermented blueberries from making his kombucha that he sells like at the farmer's market. Then we have another woman who makes wine from, from, from elderberries, but then she, through this like database, would be able to go and see, well, maybe instead of using elderberries, I'll use this guy's fermented blueberries that are left over. So is the idea that you would create more efficiency within this community, is that the Efficiency hope? and connection, but without dependence upon money. So it's reputation instead of money. So can you imagine scientists or biotechnologists doing something similar as a human involved and just listening <laughs> to people, the people who the thing I mean, that they're I engineering think, would affect? I think interestingly, like that the the biology community is very open to listening, which is uh, especially the synthetic biology community, um, simply because they come from such diverse backgrounds already. They don't come from biology. A lot of them they come from computing or um, chemical engineering, you name it. Uh, I mean, so they're already a very diverse bunch. And I also think they're happy when others enter into their tent. So I think there's actually a nice opportunity to kind of create, and I think they already have, create that dialogue that, that you're describing. Now, I don't, I don't know what the trade is here, right? I don't know what the, the fermented blueberries and the kombucha are in this equation. Don't forget the tractors. And the tractors. But it's interesting, yeah. Well, is that is that a principle before um, I have Dana speak? Um, is that just a principle already in any of the existing codes of ethics? Because I know there are a lot of other ethics from like rocket scientists or DIY stuff, but is that an ethic to say, hey, we should make sure that we have all stakeholders at the table of whatever this thing that we're making is going to affect? I think it's ideal. I think in effect, at least when I've, when I've come to those forums, there's always missing groups. And, and usually what you, f what you hear from the scientists when you ask them, hey, why isn't this group here? The answer is always, well, I don't know anyone in that group. And so I didn't know who to invite. And you hear that a lot. And, and, they, and some groups actually have that as like a principle of like, we will involve all stakeholders? Or is I, it just kind of I, like? I, I, I don't know if it's a principle yeah. per se, but it's an ideal that people, people like the idea of it. So this could become one of the principles. That, it, it, yeah, yes. that, I mean, like yes. right now you're you're asking for the community, like what's working for you guys. Mm -hmm. So what should you got? You know, what should biotech do? So it's a, that this could be an emergent principle. Yeah. I gotta Dana. get my notebook. Yeah. I think that one of the hardest things to do when you're trying to get uh, people to address emergent issues where the answers are in many ways unknown is that buy-in and stakeholder analyses actually have to deal with information asymmetries. 
which is to say that there are a lot of people who you know you may want to invite to the table, like public citizens who do not know shit about biology, right? And that actually becomes an interesting challenge in all of this because that asymmetry is often used in um, as a as a tool of power by a whole variety of actors. And I think this is where it's different when you're still in the basis of research, where there's curiosity and exchange versus once um, economic or political interests start to be um, at play. And so this is what I would say is you know one of the bases of a lot of how we think about organizing meetings, for example, is that a lot of what we do in those darn primers is to try to map out what is known, what is unknown, what are open questions, where do we, do, you know, what are the stakes, try to provide some mapping to at least level the playing field a little bit so that a conversation can actually not go off into um, Hollywoodification. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges in, try, in terms of trying to get buy-in from all of these actors is like, how do you do it in a way where you recognize that there are serious information asymmetries involved and serious power dynamics at play? I mean, that's really interesting. So some, one of the reasons why we started GenSpace was to change that equation a little bit. I mean, GenSpace is a grassroots organization. Anyone can come in. Um, and, and learn about the stuff. If their idea is safe and they want to explore it, they are welcome to. We have people who can help. Uh, the issue is that you know, that's not reaching the broadest public. We are reaching people who are, have genuine interest and, and want to literally get their hands wet. And have time. And have time and all those other things. Um, you, you know, as a journalist, this is a problem I run up against all the time, right? I have to write a story, and I want the story to be exciting and interesting, and I also don't want to overblow the issue. And over and over, I see the issue overblown. Like, the latest thing uh, that we're dealing with at GenSpace, I guess, is the CRISPR story. I don't know if no, people know what that is. So CRISPR is, how do I put this? It's a, it's a gene editing technology. It allows you biotechnologists to go somewhere in the genome, anywhere of your choosing, and make a cut and basically break a gene. Or conversely, you could go anywhere in the genome and insert a gene. And that's extremely powerful. So I will give you an example for why that's extremely powerful. So if I am, or this is already happening, a crop um, a seed, a seed company, right, where I do this like a Monsanto type. Um, I can make that cut. It doesn't actually, regulation-wise, it doesn't count as genetic engineering because you're not adding a foreign gene in. You're not using all the, ge the traditional tools of genetic engineering. It seems, and this is still, we're still figuring it out, so paper after paper keeps coming out, um, but it seems like it's not regulated. Well, yeah, China was the first to use CRISPR on human embryos, and now the UK has said to scientists, you can come to us and anyone can use CRISPR on embryos that will not, yeah, human embryos. So, I mean, these are, these are interesting, right? But I, I think what ends up happening is you have um, a headline that says, you know, designer babies, or you have a headline or you don't even hear the story about crop companies using this technology and not counting it as a genetically modified organism or whatever that even means. Um, so I, I just I, what I what I find is that w the first thing we do at the lab is we have to kind of cut through the hype, mm -hmm. and then start laying the foundations. And usually the foundations start really from the molecule up, and then the conversation seems to get far more sensible very quickly. Well, I'm curious from um, Dana and others who have been working on the policy end of data ethics is is uh, that. One of the arguments for the th why the community needs to get together to take, be proactive about this is that you don't want just the government blindly putting down these rules w without a deep understanding of the space, without engaging the stakeholders. And you also don't want industry only setting the space. And I think that's why it's so important what we're doing here at Data and Society, because it's creating a, another set of stakeholders that don't fall into government or industry. And so what has been your success or challenges or learnings along the way around that that potentially might be useful for the what you know you're doing it's hard <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only thing i'd throw out there on that front before hopefully there's somebody else who wants to take that is that 
one of the big tensions that always comes into play is that like in an ideal world, you want meaningful representation in these kinds of debates and, and politics and battles, right? In an ideal world, that is what a democratic government is supposed to do. We don't live in that ideal world, and we have to acknowledge that. But we also have to uh, tease out what it means for a series of experts to battle out their understanding of what's going on, or what it means to empower different communities to actually be meaningful stakeholders and empowered stakeholders in that process. And I think that tension is one where research plays a very critical role in all of this, where journalism plays a very critical role in this, is to what degree are you know those of us who get to live and think uh, for a living, get to basically produce knowledge, engage in these debates, get to go really, really deep. To what degree should we be the ones who are playing the powerful role of helping negotiate this out? Or to what degree do we have a, a moral responsibility to profess, to inform, um, in order to make certain that other people are in a place that they deal with it? And I think that tension is at the crux of what a lot of these ethical battles have come down to. Where for some, especially within scholarly communities, ethics is the thing that academics can uniquely hold accountable to the public, you know, public eye. For others, that's actually dangerous uh, for various different, you know, political stakeholder reasons. And what does it mean that a bunch of elite scholars in an Ivy League tower are doing that? And I think that tension becomes really real. And I think it's one of the things that becomes really important as we think about what it means that we get to all live in a world of constantly centralized expertise. I think that's a lot for you to think about, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep working on it. And with that, I hope you and Dana continue your conversations and you also continue your conversations with the community around this topic. Uh, this, I want to thank you and thank everyone for the workshop and their participation. And uh, we'll be seeing hopefully more of these kind of conversations around. And now that we have a deeper understanding of bio data and the difference between uh, computing data. So thank right. you so much, guys. Look forward to the next Data by 70.